you're hearing is the sound of a two-cylinder 814 East Oak engine made in Vancouver in 1950. And the sound is very typical and it's a historical sound because you just don't hear it on the water anymore. And yet, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, every morning you would hear this sound in harbors up and down this coast as there were hundreds of boats that had East Oak engines or Vivian engines or various engines of simple gasoline engines uh, of this type. And this is the kind of sound they made. And in many ways it's, it's very evocative for people because people will come down the dock and all they'll hear is the sound and they'll come over and say, I haven't heard that sound for 40 or 50 years. Or, so. or my first job was in a tugboat that had a three-cylinder east over. You know, it just, it's just, it's an unusual kind of connection to the past. It's an oral connection to the past. And, uh, uh, and it really does trigger very good memories of life. Well, the East Hope brothers uh, started manufacturing engines in 1902 in Steveston. Uh, well, in Vancouver, actually. Sorry, they were down by uh, in Coal Harbor. Uh, they moved to Steveston much later in the 1950s. Um, they were a very religious family. Um, the manual that came with the engines had beautiful photogravures of the various engines they sold and then I uh, had some pages of instructions on how to use them. That took up half the manual. And then at the very last page of the manual, the manual part, it said, if none of the above suggestions work for getting your engine working, turn the page. And you turn the page and the entire Gospel according to St. John was printed in the other half of the book. And uh, anyway, they were uh, very typical marine engine. Uh, marine engines were made by small manufacturers all over North America. Uh, this was before the days of big companies like General Motors. And uh, uh, they uh, were locally cast. The ironwork was locally cast. The cylinders came. Uh, originally they made the pistons, but by the 1920s they were buying pistons from the Ford Motor Company and connecting rods and valves and just doing the casting work. All of the pumps and the auxiliary hardware were bronze, most of it cast in Vancouver. Um, they were very simple engines, they were easy to run, um, they were powerful in their own way, had a lot of torque, uh, and they were very, uh, very reliable. And they were, and people loved them. And uh, The only reason, of course, they went out of favor was it became important in the fishing industry to get to the fishing in grounds more quickly to carry larger loads of fish, to drive larger boats, and so the diesel engine superseded them. And East Hope's last attempt at keeping an engine in the marine market was in the 1970s, and they experimented with using their engine castings, but actually running uh, diesel fuel with injectors, and injectors and an injection pump. Uh, and that attempt was not successful. And they also made uh, fishing girdies, the trolling girdies, the bronze girdies you often see usually in sets of three on the backs of trollers and that was a big part of their business so for a 50 or 60 year period. I believe they closed their doors in Steveston probably around 1985 We know very little about the Songbird. We know that she was built in Nanaimo in 1950. We do not know who the builder was. We do know that the engine is the original engine because we have uh, a copy of the original uh, bill of sale from East Oak to the man who had the Songbird built. She was fished commercially for 10 years, from 1950 to 1960. Uh, she would have been rigged as a troller. Uh, she was a one-man troller. Um, and at that point, the wheelhouse would have been lower and shorter. The engine would have been inside the cabin. The area where the engine is now, this was open. That little cabin wasn't there. There was a large open hatch. And you can see on the side of the hull, 
two oblong covers. This had what was called a live well. So when you fished, you put the fish in the hold and the hold was filled with salt water. And this was, you know, when the hold got, when the water level in the hold came up, this is where it could drain. And then behind the live well, there was an open cockpit, which is where the fishermen would steer the boat from and would work the gear. And so everything, the boat was kind of lower, shorter wheelhouse, uh, live well, open cockpit. And it was very, very typical of the small one-man Columbia River style uh, trollers, you know, of that sort of 1920 to 1950 period. And of course at that time, uh, in 1950, you could still make a decent living commercial fishing with a small boat like this. It was put in a barn in 1960. The engine was taken out beside the boat, and it sat there for 20 years. And in 1980, um, someone fell in love with it and had to have it and bought it and put the engine back in and got it running and working. And I believe the boat was at Expo 86 as part of the transportation collection. At Expo, it went downhill again and was neglected. And again, I'm not sure of the dates on this, but I believe it was around 2000. A retired machinist purchased it and refitted it completely, extended the cabin, filled in the live well, built the little cabin aft. He moved the engine back so there was room to actually have a proper cabin. Um, he found all this wonderful old marine hardware, the bronze pumps, the bronze ventilators, the bronze tie-up posts. And, you know, he did an enormous amount of work, like these light boxes here, all just custom made. You know, they're not off the shelves. So he basically made those himself beautiful handrail and the, the, the bolts that hold these on go right down and tie the whole cabin down to the hub. And apparently he used to take it to Princess Louisa Inlet in the summers from Vancouver. And uh, I mean, and he fussed with details. I mean, they're, you know, he went, the wheelhouse windows are lovely and they open, but they're not just glass, they're beveled glass, like you would have found on a fancy yacht. And uh, uh, the mechanical work was all done to a very high standard. I mean, the, the steering gear, if you look at the, the linkages in the steering gear, I mean, you would find similar like linkages on a 50-foot boat. I mean, the, the whole thing is just beautifully done. And so he had it, I believe, until around 2008 or 9, and then sold it, and the people who bought it discovered that it needed significant replanking on the hull. So they hauled it out of the water and replanked about 40% of the hull. Um, And then they sold it in 2016 to Sidney Johnston and Angel Demers, who lived on a big boat in the in the uh, in the last of the funky marinas across from Manassas Island on the Fraser River. And when Sid died and Angel had to dispose of their property, um, she gave it to LMS. She was a lovely lady, very very nice lady. Very excited we were going to get it. Sadly, she fell in the water and drowned so, two weeks after she gave us the boat. And uh, so it's a, there's a little plaque on the bow in memory of Sydney and, and Joe. And thank you for their, their donation. That's the story of the song. Uh, as I say, hopefully we can fill in more details over the years, but uh, that's all we have. When we got the boat, 
it was it hadn't been really used much for some years and it was basically in good condition but it was tawdry it, it just was kind of run down like there was quite a there was a significant amount of rot in the deck here uh, on the corner of the cabin so I had to dig all that out and replace the decking uh, the engine needed uh, we've done a lot of work on the engine it needed the starter rebuilt it needed a completely rebuilt carburetor it needed a rebuilt just it needed a new distributor cap now it's interesting the distributor cap is a style of distributor cap that was available from about 1935 to 1942 uh, it no longer exists in any parts book but after searching on eBay for a considerable amount of time I found a new old stock one in Connecticut for fifty dollars and so we ended up with a new distributor cap and it's when with anything old like this in mechanical you have to be able to be very flexible in how you deal with it and I had to make a new head gasket for the engine um, there was uh, problems with the gear wasn't uh, staying in gear so that all had to be adjusted so a lot of little and a lot of just tidy up and clean up but basically we haven't had to do any major work to it at this point But the only thing I, I would have to say uh, is that it's a unique boat in many ways because of the way it has been brought back to life. And it's, it displays a number of things um, that you just don't see on boats anymore. I mean, the quality of the castings, the, uh, uh, the fittings, the bronze portholes, the, uh, all of this is, you know, you know, each one of them tells a story, each one of them points to a time when this kind of hardware was what you would find at the catalogs and uh, and it just isn't there anymore and uh, uh, you know mostly bronze was the predominant metal on boats up until the late 1960s stainless steel has almost completely replaced it